All right, welcome to CBLDF's Take Pride in Comics webinar. Today we're going to discuss the challenges facing LBTQ plus content. Specifically, we're going to talk about why comics and other literature centered on LB LGBTQ plus characters are targeted so frequently and what we can do to ensure that these important books stay on the shelves. My name is Holly Dotson and I am the Education Coordinator for the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. Uh, before we introduce our moderator and panelists today, I would like to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do at CBLDF. We are a nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting the First Amendment rights of the comics art form and its community of retailers, creators, publishers, librarians, and readers. The CBLDF provides legal referrals, representation, advice, assistance, and education in furtherance of these goals. We are a small organization that is directly supported by the con contributions of our members and donors. If you can make a monetary contribution, please consider signing up for membership or making a donation for one of our premium items. If you are unable to make a contribution, you can still help by spreading the word about CBLDF, following us on Twitter and Facebook, and distributing our literature in your community. Um, before I introduce Betsy, I would like to uh, Make sure that everyone knows um, how to uh, use the logistics of, of our Zoom um, platform here. If you let your mouse hover over the bottom of your screen, uh, you should see um, an option for Q&A. We are going to hold off on Q&A until the very end of our presentation. So um, we ask that you hold your questions until the end. Um, also, I will be posting information, um, links to resources and, um, and, and other uh, things in the chat bar, which will show up on the side there. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our moderator and then turn things over to her. I'm going to mute myself. And, and as I said, I'll be posting um, resources in the chat bar for you. Um, today, we're, our moderator is Betsy Gomez. She is the Band Books Week coordinate, Coalition Coordinator and former Editorial Director for the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. She manages resources and edu editorial content for bandbooksweek.org and continues to, to advise CBLDF on educational matters. Gomez is the director of CBLDF's book, I'm sorry, is the editor of CBLDF's book about the Women Who Changed Free Expression in Comics, CBLDF presents She Changed Comics. With an extensive background in educational publishing, Gomez has worked as a content developer and editor for several companies, including Hoofton, I can never say this correctly, but see, it always gets stuck in my mouth. Will you please say? Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know why that's so hard for me to say, but it always gets stuck there. Uh, Pearson Education, among others. And her work combines her love of comics with her passion for education and the right to read. Um, I'm going to turn things over to her and let her uh, introduce our panelists. Thank you all for being here. And I will turn things over to Betsy. All right. Thank you, Ollie, for the introduction. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to get right into it. I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves. Tell us who you are, what you do, and uh, tell us about your first queer comic. Katie, you want to kick us off? I sure can. Uh, so my name is Katie Proctor. I'm a comics retailer in Portland, Oregon. I have the um, inclusive feminist comic book store, Books with Pictures. And um, I would, uh, depending on how you read it, my first queer comic was either Sandman or Small Favors, depending on how queer you need your queer to be. Uh, yeah. <laughs> nice, thank you, Katie. Justin. Uh, my name is Justin Hall. I'm an associate professor of comics at the California College of the Arts. I'm a cartoonist as well um, and a comics historian. I uh, edited a book called No Straight Lines, Four Decades of Queer Comics, which was a big kind of collection of LGBTQ uh, comics and the history behind them, uh, which is we're turning into a feature length film, documentary film now. Um, I've taught comics history as a Fulbright scholar in Europe and uh, um, just, I'm a geek. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, uh, and I made, as I said, I made comics too. So I've made um, Hard to Swallow, which is a gay erotic comic series, Two Travel Tales, Glamazonia. Uh, working on a big graphic novel right now. I'm working on an anthology of queer horror comics uh, as well. Thank you. Valerie? I'm Valerie Acklin. I'm the head of reference and teen services at the Belmore Memorial Library on Long Island in New York. Uh, I am currently serving my second year uh, as part of the ALA 
uh, Rainbow Roundtable, Stonewall Awards, um, the literature end of the award. So I'm one of the jurors uh, and I'm also a member of the, of the roundtable. Thank you. And Paige. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Paige Braddock. And currently, I, you may have noticed Snoopy's behind me. I'm uh, <laughs> the Chief Creative Officer at Charles M. Schultz Creative Associates, which is uh, Charles Schultz's studio in California. And um, I have done some kids' comics, some kids' books. I think the first gay comic that I did that where the main character was really out was Jane's World, which ran for about 20 years. So that's kind of my story in a nutshell. Nice. Thank you. All right, let's get into it. Justin, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you worked on No Straight Lines compiling queer comics and uh, kind of historical information about the representation of queer individuals in comics. Could you speak a little bit about the history of queer representation in the format? Yeah, I mean, in terms of the, the way we kind of think about those terms, both kind of queer and comics in modern uh, contexts, I would, I would say um, that the first where comics were really Tom of Finland and some of the uh, erotic, uh, gay male erotic work. Uh, so Tom of Finland started making sequential art um, in the 1950s. Uh, he did it underground, it was completely illegal uh, back then, and uh, started distributing uh, it to his friends. It uh, picked up the interest of um, Bob Miser, who was the, the uh, publisher of Physique Pictorial and some of the other big beefcake magazines in the United States. Uh, and uh, Miser brought over Tom's work and um, dubbed him Tom of Finland. And uh, his real name is Tuko Laksonen, which I am butchering the Finnish pronunciation of that. Um, and then in the 60s, he created uh, Kake comics, which were um, uh, erotic comics that were published in, in Denmark first in 1968. Um, and uh, 1969, Denmark actually um, uh, made pornography legal. It's the first country in the world to, to have legal pornography. Um, so I, it was initially published and it was illegal actually. Um, so Finland, you know, Tom, Tom of Finland definitely inspired a whole generation, uh, many generations of erotic, queer erotic art. Um, but then after that, there's a kind of an, an, another wave of queer comics uh, content that happens around the time of Stonewall when there's an explosion of queer magazines and newspapers and periodicals that uh, emerge with this kind of birth of this new modern uh, queer rights movement, uh, like The Advocate, for example, and they need comics content. So, uh, you get a lot of kind of New Yorker style uh, gag strips um, uh, beginning in the late 60s um, around that material. And uh, that also develops, ends up developing into uh, strips like Dykes to Watch Out For, uh, Howard Cruz's uh, Wendell. Uh, so some really important work was, uh, was done in the, in the queer per periodicals and the magazines and newspapers. Uh, um, and then uh, underground comics movement, uh, comics with an X, uh, that starts, um, you know, uh, really kind of explodes in uh, San Francisco and the Bay Area and other and New York um, in the beginning of the 70s, end of the 60s. Um, and initially, uh, the underground comics movement was very much dominated by um, uh, straight men, essentially. And uh, but there's a, a, a reaction to that. Uh, we see that with uh, "It Ain't Me, Babe" comics, which was the first. Um, uh, all women's anthology, uh, underground comics anthology, that happened. That's uh, created by Trina Robbins in uh, Berkeley. Uh, out of there's a Berkeley feminist newspaper called it ain't, it ain't Me Babe, and then this is a supplement that's added to the to the to the newspaper, uh, and then it's distributed and published by uh, Last Gasp, which is a local comics publisher and distributor here in San Francisco, and that does well enough that in 1970, uh, 1970. Um, uh, uh, women's Comics Collective uh, is created, which is Trina Robbins, Lee Mars, Aline Kaminsky Crum, Diane Newman, some other folks. And in, the, um, in that first issue, uh, Trina actually does a co comic, a short comic called Sandy Comes Out. And Sandy Comes Out is actually about Robert Crum's sister, uh, Sandy Colorado, who had left her marriage with her baby and had moved in with Robert and his wife at the time, uh, 1969, 70. And according to them, uh, uh, Robert immediately tried to kind of pass her off to his greasy cartoonist buddies. And uh, uh, Trina comes swooping in and says, hey, why don't you come and live with me? You're my roommate, I need a roommate. So Sandy moves in with her and they become friends. And then Sandy comes out as a lesbian and moves into a gay hippie commune uh, in the Haight-Ashbury, which is what you did in, <laughs> in the early 70s as a, as a queer person. Um, so 
Uh, Trina then does a three page story in the inaugural issue of Women's Comics that is about Sandy's coming out experience called Sandy Comes Out. Sandy helps her write it, but it's basically a, a straight person kind of doing the first coming, come, coming out story in, in comics. Uh, Mary Wings uh, sees this and is uh, upset that a straight woman was the, creating the created the first coming out story. Uh, so she creates Come Out Comics in the basement of a radical women's karate cooperative in Oregon uh, in 1973. So that really is the first uh, lesbian comic book. It's the first kind of queer comic book entirely created by a queer person uh, that's you know not erotic. Um, and that really begins the, the kind of birth of the queer and feminist um, underground comic scene, which then culminates in, uh, so, you know, runs through tits and clits, uh, wet satin, uh, women's comics, these different uh, queer and or these feminist underground anthologies. And then gay comics begins in 1980 with Howard Cruz taking on the first uh, edit uh, as the first editor. And that becomes the backbone of kind of queer comics, that, that uh, underground series for the next, um, I think there were 20, uh, is it 25 issues, 18 years, I believe. Uh, and, you know, after that, there's just, you know, kind of lateral explosion of, of material. There's the punk scene really uh, delivers its own queer content and, and the forms of uh, uh, punk zines like uh, Hotted Paisan, Homicidal Lesbian Terrorist, um, Curbside by Robert Kirby, people like that. Uh, Paige Braddock, our very own Paige Braddock, creates the first serialized um, uh, comic strip with a queer, uh, prominent queer character. Um, and um, uh, then, you know, web comics hit, and then you wind up with a real lateral explosion of material. And now there's just, there's just too much content out there to, to you know, quantify. It's just, it's, it's amazing. I, I think Paige can probably speak to this as well, but there was, you know, generations where it felt like all us queer cartoonists, we all knew each other. And yeah, there were like six of us. <laughs> and now, like, oh my God. Cast of thousands. <laughs> A cast of thousands, and it's international, and it's you know all these different kinds of queer identities being represented. It's a, it's a real golden age right now of of queer content and comics. is very very exciting. I always I love being on panels with you, Justin, because I realize how little I know. You're like I love listening to you talk about comics history. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's 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 funny we don't have. You know, comics, we don't, we still, we still don't have textbooks around this stuff, right? Right, so right. We're still kind of pulling it out of our own, you know, butts. So this is your oral history. You're going to pass it down through the ages. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take that. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Justin. Um, let's put Paige in the hot seat for a minute. Can you tell us a little bit about Jane's World? You started in the 1990s. Uh, what were your motivations for creating it? And uh, tell us a little bit about the series itself. I like to say it started as a result of boredom and too much sugary cereal while watching bad late night TV. That's, that's how it started. Um, but you know, I, I think I've said this on gay panels before, like the big gay panel that happens in San Diego, but I really wasn't very brave when I started Jane's world. It wasn't uh, overtly lesbian and it sort of, she sort of tiptoed around her sexuality. I sort of eased into it. And I don't think um, Jane really came out like fully came out and sort of owned it um, until I moved to San Francisco and I met Justin and some of the other uh, queer cartoonists on the West coast. I mean, I was in Georgia. I was in a conservative area. My parents lived an hour away. You know, I was just in an environment where I felt like um, I sort of had a cloud of censorship hanging over my head. I don't know. I didn't feel free to really just like write, uh, maybe write from the heart at that point. Um, so initially I started Jane's World just as a sort of creative outlet because I was working in journalism at the time, which wasn't that creative. And so I would come home at night and then it was almost like I was journaling a little bit um, and then just uploading it as a web comic in the beginning. Um, and then it wasn't until I moved to the West coast, as I said, and I met Justin and some other guys and I was working with Schultz that I really started to take the work seriously and sort of raise the bar on what I was doing, I think. Um, that's when Jane's World really took off. So that was really 1999, I guess. I had been doing it for a couple of years, but uh, I don't think the level of craft was where I wanted it to be until probably 99. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. <laughs> well, no, thank you. Um, so Paige, Justin, you're both 
uh, queer comics creators, what kind of opposition did you encounter um, as you were making your work? Uh, I, I, it's interesting. It depends on the kind of work. Um, so I did a, a gay erotic series called Hard to Swallow um, with uh, Dave Davenport. And that was, that was interesting because we, we, at one point we actually lost our printer because um, they were, it was, I guess they were freaked. Uh, there was a printer in, in Texas and they had published their first book or two of ours and then, and then kind of freaked out with the, <laughs> the content got progressively, <laughs> I don't know, gayer or weirder for them. And so I, I've uh, heard of this, um, we just uh, did a Queers and Comics conference in, uh, in New York. Uh, Jennifer Camper and I run this thing. Jennifer created it in uh, 2015. And it's a nice forum for uh, queer creators to come together and talk about different issues and do different panels. Um, and one of the things we we've, we've talked about is specifically this problem of printing uh, queer explicit content because there tends to be kind of a double standard oftentimes um, with explicit content that printers and publishers have no problem with if it's straight, uh, if it's same sex, that's, an, that's another issue. Um, so um, that's one thing. I, I would say the, the, the rest of my comics, you, you know, we definitely got pigeonholed more, you know, earlier on. I'm sure Paige can um, speak to this as well. There is a pigeonholing that would happen with queer content. We'd kind of be relegated to a certain part of the convention hall and kind of, um, uh, and that's not is true anymore. I mean, you just see kind of queer content kind of permeating in an organic way throughout um, the convention halls um, uh, in, in a way that didn't happen before. It was either, before it was either kind of queer or not and very kind of compartmentalized. And, uh, and, I, and I think it also comes from the, the idea that queer comics, the queer comics world, which really um, came out of the insular uh, queer publishing world of queer newspapers and queer bookstores and distributors and um, all of that was in a parallel universe to the rest of the comics industry. Um, and it's not, it, it actually took quite a while for those things to integrate and uh, dovetail. I had Alison Bechtel on a, on a uh, queer comics panel at the Alternative Press Expo in 2003. And that was the first time, she'd already been making Dykes to Watch Out for for over 20 years. Um, and, but it was the first time she'd ever been to a comic book convention. I was at that convention too. That was, that was a good one. Were you there? Was I was there, yeah, that was great. <laughs> yeah, which is kind of, uh, but it's, it, it, that was a kind of moment, like the very early 2000s, it f I felt like yeah. people, those of us who were, you know, kind of in that queer media, you know, insular world were then, were then able to start coming to the mainstream conventions, being on, being, you know, dovetailing in with the rest of the comics industry. Yeah, I think I've noticed, what I've noticed more is that when, when I first really got started and what you're talking about in the early 2000s is that we were sort of siloed. And now I think because I noticed that um, comics readers now, they read everything. They don't just read straight comics or gay comics. Like people who like good comics will just read everything. And I think that has helped us, you know, populate uh, out onto the main floor of conventions and stuff and not be, like you said, sequestered so much in our little corner. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that's kind of a good segue into our next question. I'd like to have Katie or Valerie start on this conversation. How has the per uh, perception of queer comics changed over, um, over time? Um, certainly in, in the library, I'm, I'm lucky enough to um, work with teens and adults in what I do. Um, and I think the biggest change has been with adults, where previously uh, the queer comics did, uh, that we had in the collection um, probably 10 years ago um, were not uh, getting a lot of circulation. Um, if people were looking at them, it was while they were in the library, not checking it out. Um, and then, you know, um, certainly with uh, the adaptation of Fun Home on Broadway, all of a sudden the explosion, um, that became extraordinarily popular. Um, and that really brought a lot of new readers in and then seeing that as a stepping stone um, to other things. So graphic memoirs, um, queer graphic memoir, memoirs particularly, um, very popular in my library. So people went from Alison Bechdel to uh, Nicole J. George's to um, uh, one that's popular right now is a brand new one um, called Gender Queer um, that's getting a lot of uh, circ at my library. So with adults, it's been wonderful to see how it's really been a stepping stone and, and there's been a ripple effect over the years um, as people get more and more into it. For the teens, 
they've always been super enthusiastic. Um, they will read anything. And once they get their hands on Lumberjanes or Moonstruck or my brother's husband, um, they just want to read, they want to read it all and they can't read it fast enough. So that's really been consistent, but it's been heartening to see how it's been embraced by the adult, the older readers who maybe are not historically comic readers and, and seeing them um, embrace it. Sorry. Katie, what about your perspective as a retailer? Well, I mean, I've got to say, I'm, I'm sort of coming in as the new, ki new kid here. My, my store is having its third anniversary this year, this, this month. So um, it's harder to speak to change over time because I, I don't have a lot of it under my belt. Um, I definitely, uh, I do have a little bit of the legacy of that. People definitely come in to the shop um, sometimes and ask where my section for uh, queer comics are uh, or LGBT comics. And I do have a separate shelf uh, for queer memoir because that's the way my nonfiction section is shelved. But as far as where you're going to find a book like Heathen or a book uh, like, you know, the X-Men um, uh, Iceman series that Cena Grace just finished up, uh, it, it lives with the X-Men, right? There's no separate, like, this is where the gay X-Men live and this is where the gay Vikings live. Like, they live with the rest of the comics. And people, uh, we have a big rainbow flag in the window and we definitely call out occasionally if a comic has queer content. Um, but ultimately, uh, when we do our pride booth, we, we pull out um, sort of comics with queer themes and from the very first year that we did a booth at Pride, uh, we've literally not been able to take with us all of the books in our inventory that have queer themes because that is how many queer comics are. It's like, we'll pull a third of the shop and be like, that's it, that's all we can hold in the booth. That one's gonna have to stay home this time because even though it's pretty queer, it's, it's, we don't have room. Uh, so being able to say, yes, we're a standard comic book store. Yes, you know, this is not, it's not a feminist bookstore, it's not a queer bookstore in that way of, you know, 10, 15 years ago, those were very sort of set apart spaces, being able to at once straddle the line of this is a store with a really general population that is explicitly stocking queer content, but it's everywhere. Um, and, uh, you know, and it's, so I, I, think, I think that's something that I really feel <laughs> I feel the legacy of it having been done differently than we do it. Um, I mean, it's, it's amazing to think of like that in 19, in the 1980s, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, the, the, the head publisher of, of Marvel comics, uh, uh, Jim Shooter, uh, Shooter, right? Yeah. Sh Jim Shooter. Yeah. Um, so he, he said that there were no gays in the Marvel universe and that like, <laughs> Which is just kind of amazing. Like that, not that long ago, there were no gays. Oh, you, yeah. All of those, yeah. All of those like you know, muscly men and women with their skin tight outfits. Nothing, nothing. Gay yeah, going. nothing gay going on there. Nope. Mm -mm. Um, but now, like that, it's, it's so permeated in kind of all the different genres. There's queer content in all the different genres. So I, I guess I would worry about, uh, which is wonderful. The the thing that I worry about with the loss of kind of queer and feminist bookstores in particular, is some of the material that doesn't cross over so well. So something like a Hada Paisan, Homicidal Lesbian Terrorist, something that's more... God, if it was in print, I could sell it every day. I literally have people coming off the street and asking for it. Okay, so... so <laughs> um, it, it's, I mean, it's something that people walk in and ask for. I have one woman who comes in every month and asks for it. I think she may have it in her calendar. Um, as far as I know, it's not been solicited for, for reprinting at any point, uh, but she really wants it. Um, I mean, I also have the benefit of having grown up with a uh, late blooming radical queer mom. Um, so I always had a lot of that content in my world uh, from like late adolescent, early adolescence forward. Um, so I, I, it's also, it's Portland, right? It's, it's not, I feel like here there's a lot more room. Um, I do occasionally get pushed back because I say that the whole story is very generalist and I do have an erotica section, but I find it very hard to stock straight erotica because a lot of it's real gross. Um, and so people are like, where's your straight erotica? I'm like, I don't like it. So I don't buy it. 
But yeah, it's a great erotica section. I promise you'll like it. You'll find something you like. <laughs> I, always, I always have a moment in, the, in every semester with my students where I come in with a big stack of erotic comics, kind of slam it on the table, and I'm like, you all should make pornography. It's, you know, like, you know, sex and desire is as important as birth and death and one of the great profundities of the human experience, and we should be making great art about it. So don't let someone, else, and especially if you're a woman or queer person, person of color, don't let someone else colonize your sexual space. Make your own erotica. People will love you for it. Um, but we also need to encourage, you know, straight dudes to make better erotica also. They really <laughs> should. They need to be a physics <laughs> person or I'm just going to break something. What's been shocking to me is that in, um, in, in my library, uh, we actually started um, curating a small um, erotica collection and queer erotica in there, what well, comics. Um, and I keep trying to get someone to challenge it and they, they're not taking it, they just won't do it. <laughs> I'm like, I'm putting it on display, I'm having it be the book of the month, nothing, absolutely nothing. So times, you know, really do change. So just to, just to get us back on track, uh, I do want to point out if you do run into a challenge, Valerie, call CBLDF. <laughs> and, um, absolutely. We're here to help. And so uh, let's talk a little bit about, you know, what are the things that uh, we've kind of observed with these, the perception, uh, how the perception of LGBTQ plus comics has changed over time is that there's more material available for younger readers. Um, so Paige, I'd like to have you kick this off. Let's talk about why uh, queer content is important for younger readers. Um. I don't know, maybe because I grew up in a, in a more rural, more conservative part of the country. I'm always, I have this awareness in the back of my mind that, you know, I want, I want Jane's world to be out there for some teenager in Kansas who doesn't have a queer community or any kind of like safety net or any kind of exposure to, to gay content. I mean, now there's so much stuff on TV that, that people have it, but I, I feel like there should be entry points for, for, for gay kids, right, to find content that they can relate to. And I think I might have mentioned a book. I've been reading more uh, middle grade and younger reader stuff, mostly middle grade stuff, I guess, graphic novels. And I think I mentioned the one, uh, the, the Prince and the Dressmaker, which I, I thought was really great. And actually, after I read it, I sent it to a friend of mine whose 10-year-old is suddenly obsessed with um, graphic novels. And, and she's not she's not queer, but her, she has two moms. And so suddenly she's reading stories where she sees her family reflected in these store in some of these stories. Right. So I think that's as important as a kid who might be searching for themselves. I don't know if that answers your question. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a kid book expert, but um, I did when I was doing, I did a series called sneaky Cecil that has three volumes and I was really trying hard to make it gender neutral in my head when I wrote it. It's all about amphibians and one free range hamster. And I was trying to make it gender neutral for kids um, for that reason. Like there's not any explicit gay content in it, but the characters aren't really focused on their sexuality either. Right. They're um, focused on the environment. But at the same time, I thought it, I thought it would be nice to just, I don't know, try to do that in the story, even though it wasn't part of my sort of mission statement for that series. Mm -hmm. But I'm sort of aware of it. I'm working on another kid series now. And I just, you start to realize when you talk to more kids and talk to more classrooms of how kids get sort of pelted with this uh, gender message very early on. And I, and I wish I had had a more gender neutral experience. And so I try to uh, address that when I'm talking to kids. And so this, this next series I'm doing, I'm actually, there is, it's, it's animals and there is a human character in it, but I never specifically say what gender or race they are. It'll just be interesting to see like how kids respond to that, right? Mm. I use the they pronoun, you know, when they talk about they're human and uh, I don't know, it's just interesting to try to pay attention to that when you're, when you're telling stories or reading stories. Uh, working on a science fiction story right now in which there it's kind of post-gender in the sense of like everybody uses a uh, zeezer pronoun and there are no uh, gendered uh you know jobs or or uh language or um uh clothing or anything like that it's it's interesting to try to construct characters without gender it's it's in some it's, ways quite liberating in some ways quite difficult yeah it's a challenge yeah 
Mm -hmm. I know that for me, there's what I feel like is that kids grow up, you said they're, they're bombarded with these gender messages. And I feel like they're also just, there is this ubiquity of straightness. There is this assumption of straightness and this assumption of cisness. Um, and I feel like curating a sort of book availability for me as a retailer or as a librarian or in schools, that just reflect to them a different world that even if it's not their experience that that if any particular kid is cis or not is straight or not um just creating a sense of possibility in gender and sexuality so that the kids who need something to latch on to can grab it and everybody else just feels a little bit less constricted by all of these norms that we're stuck in mm -hmm. I was thinking, I recently read the, somebody mentioned, I can't remember who it was now, who mentioned uh, Gender Queer, the book that, that Meyer wrote. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's probably a great book for teenagers because it basically almost either discusses or responds to any question you might have, you know? It's, it's extraordinary. It makes it okay to ask the question, right? I guess that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Maya is one of our students, uh, the California... California College of the Arts. Good work. <laughs> <laughs> well done, yes, well done. But, uh, he is very Hi, it's amazing. <laughs> well, I, I think it's one thing I would say that, like, in terms of thinking about how, you know, generational uh, queer content is in comics, like, the people making comics now, you know, uh, I think when Paige and I started, it was definitely, you know, very much, you know, straight white men making, you know, comics. That was kind of the assumption uh, and uh, for the majority of the industry. Whereas now it's, you know, the, the cohort coming into the the cohorts coming into the into our commerce program, I, I mean, it's not that way at all. I, it's um, definitely majority female, female bodied. Um, of this fourteen of the fourteen students we had this last cohort, I think three, three were trans, three were non-binary. Uh, of the remainder, cis folk, most of them were gay or bisexual. Um, at least a third to a half people of color. Um, I think there was one straight white cis dude in the whole class. And he's also welcome. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 he's a sweetheart. We, we love him. <laughs> <laughs> don't judge. I don't judge. <laughs> no, but it's, uh, it's kind of amazing how, you know, I think, you know, um, emerging artists now in, in this form, it's a very different demographic than it used to be. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Well, you, you hire a lot of these people for for Schultz, right? So how has hiring changed? Well, yeah, I mean, like, I would never have believed like half of our cartoonist crew are female, right? I mean, like, just you just didn't used to used to be so weighted um, in the other direction. And like I said, and they I'm always surprised by the books they read, and they read everything it doesn't matter. Um, so well, let's, uh, let's talk about creating inclusive spaces. Uh, Katie, I'd like to have you talk a little bit about your work as a retailer to support um, queer content and, um, uh, diverse, and the diverse community of Portland. Sure. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different pieces of that. Um, most of them are really fun. Some of them are not fun at all. Um, so I... Um, work really hard to be well networked in the artist community so that when people have new projects coming out i hear about them so that i'm not stuck entirely depending on sort of what's getting promoted by the publishers to know what i want to be ordering that's hugely helpful um, i do um, a lot of the really interesting indie uh creator-owned comic con uh, queer content is coming out through kickstarters through anthologies through self-publishing um, and so there is this extra piece of work that's like, you can't just order these all through Diamond, which is the primary distributor for periodical comics. You have to hunt them down. It's a little extra work. You may not get the margin on them you'd like, but I really feel like the cost of doing that work for the sake of having the fully inclusive or the more inclusive uh, inventory matters a lot. Um, and there is um, both, I feel like I get two types of customers mainly looking for this content, which is that I get parents who are either looking to educate themselves about their kids 
or find the very special episode that they can give to their questioning kid and be like, here is how gender kid. Um, and then, you know, work it out because it's Portland. So they're mostly, I get a lot of supportive parents or I get a lot of really confused, flustered parents who need queer comics mom to walk them through it, which I love being that person. Um, and then I get, and then I get um, sort of people looking for comics for themselves who are less interested in finding a very special episode that explains to them how gender and are much more interested in seeing themselves and their friends represented in stories. So both of those things are important to carry. Um, so that in terms of stalking is, is a piece. Um, making sure that, I mean, we throw current moving chaos notwithstanding because we're about to move locations. Uh, we have one or two major events a week um, at the shop, signings, parties, launches, concerts, all that stuff. Um, and I like to keep a check on making sure that those are representative of the communities we want to be supporting. So making sure that they're not all straight creators, making sure that they're not all white creators, making sure that they're, you know, not all cis creators, just sort of, we have limited time and limited space and making sure that we're holding events that reflect the community that we want to be supporting. Um, and then there's the not fun part, which is making sure that if somebody is actively making our spaces less, spa less safe, um, that I invite them to leave. And I've had to do that three times in three years. Uh, it absolutely sucked every time. Um, I once had an event where somebody was in the event with a queer mixer and uh, she was there, she was sitting in the room interacting with people in person, face to face, perfectly pleasantly, and then posting uh, trans -exclusive, exclusionary content on the web page on the Facebook invite for the event that she was sitting in. Um, and being really hateful and nasty to the people in the room that she was being perfectly pleasant. And it was awful to sort of sit and, and see this thing start to unfold. Um, and then when I invited her to, to find another space, um, she, she got really mad and it was a scene and it sucked. Um, but I do feel like doing that unpleasant work rather than letting it be, taking the easy route, is really important to making sure that the people in my space know that someone's gonna stand up for them. Um, and it's, it's easier for me as the owner, as the person in power, as, like, as the authority figure in the room to say, that is not welcome here um, than it is for someone who's being victimized by that person. Uh, so that, that feels like an important part of my job. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Katie. Valerie, um, what are some of the things that you do as a librarian to create um, a space for LGBTQ content? Um, we, uh, we're one of the few libraries that I know of that actually um, we're interfiling our teen and adult uh, comics. You'll, you'll be happy to know I probably will be calling you guys <laughs> because uh, we probably will see an uptick in, in people being concerned about what we have. Um, we do have a zero tolerance policy um, as far as keeping it a safe space. Um, it's usually um, uh, teenagers in the afternoon, uh, a lot of name calling, zero tolerance for that, um, whether they're hanging out in our comic section or another section of the library. Um, adults uh, usually put it, um, will come over and just talk to one of the librarians about it, uh, but we'll um, uh, try very hard uh, to make sure that if there is language being used, if someone is, say, being trans exclusionary, um, that we're taking that off the library floor. Um, so no one overhears anything. We don't want anyone uh, to be traumatized or, or be triggered during uh, their visit uh, to the library. Uh, but unlike Portland, um, the community my librarian is not very diverse. It is a white blue collar uh, community. So um, it's also important uh, for, for me to have a very diverse co collection because well, in, in Portland, the collection, uh, a lot of people 
maybe using those comics uh, as mirrors to see themselves reflected. In my community, they really act as windows um, to see another um, kind of life, see other people who, who don't, um, are not, uh, are in our town, but maybe not visible. Um, so we tend to do a diversity audit uh, at, at least every year. Sometimes it slides to every 18 months to, to two years because it's a big undertaking uh, to make sure that we do have those titles in our collection across formats, not just with graphic novels and comics. And, and then, of course, we do have our big, I, I think I have six separate pride displays up at the moment in the library. Um, but also making sure those books turn up uh, in displays um, and in book clubs uh, and on our recommended reading list throughout the year. Um, just trying to make sure that there's always, that's always in the mix. There's always something for someone to find. Great, thank you. So, um, so let's talk about the opposition to LGBTQ plus content. Uh, in the last few years, um, the majority of the titles on the American Library Association's top 10 challenged books list have been attacked over queer content. Uh, in particular, books like Raina Telgemeier's Drama, which is, um, you know, younger readers' uh, book about a middle school play has been attacked just because it has gay characters. Um, can you talk about why this is happening? Valerie, can you start with this? Sure. Um, I, it's happening because of uh, discomfort and, and, and fear. Um, uh, otherness can be threatening, I think, especially when it's in your face and books are literally in your face. And then when that book is a comic made up of pictures, um, it's impossible to ignore. And then what makes it especially difficult is when that book is targeted towards children. So I tend to see those challenges, which, which we do get. We don't get a lot of challenges for um, the erotic comics comics, but we do get challenges for children's materials and teen materials. Um, and so I tend to see them as a knee-jerk uh, reaction that says kind of more about the, the folks bringing the challenges than it does about the work itself. Anyone who's actually read drama, there is nothing quest really offensive in there. Um, but that doesn't mean that it can just be shrugged off because there are uh, disturbing trends both in libraries and in bookstores. Um, the challenges of, of trans and non-binary and, and gender non-conforming stories is definitely on the rise. And that's disturbing because um, it's not that people are objecting to actions people are taking in the in, in characters are taking in the books or ideas they're talking about. It's the people themselves that are not acceptable. And that's a horrible message uh, to be sending um, to anyone. Um, there are also more blanket bans where entire collections of uh, materials are being removed. It's not just one title. Um, it's not just uh, George, which I think was the most um, uh, challenged book of last year, not a comic, but most challenged book of last year. Um, it, it would be all the books with uh, trans characters in them. Um, and, and think about that if, if that happened somewhere else in the collection. What if uh, someone said, you know, every book with a Jewish character or a character of color should be removed. I, there would be outcry, but it, it, it kind of goes under the radar when um, it has to do with queer characters and, and we see those challenges more and more. There are uh, also, um, I think last year, there was someone posted to YouTube book burning of um, queer content. Uh, it, it just, it's terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it really does come from that place of, of fear and discomfort. And it's very rarely, rarely the kids themselves. Um, most of them don't blink an eye at most of the books that are on that, that list. Um, it's, it's coming from uh, parents and, and, and fear. Um, and on the bright side, being on that list usually boosts the sale of, of, <laughs> of the books in question. Um, so, so that's good. Um, but the challenges are serious. And, and as a librarian, it makes it really important that um, I'm there to defend them and explain why they're in the collection and maybe use it as a teachable moment. 
Okay. Thank you. So, um, so how do we deal with the censorship of queer comics? Who do we turn to for help? And what's some advice that y'all have for people who are encountering uh, attempts to censor uh, queer content? And I'd like to put this to the entire panel. Well, I, I think calmly and kindly, but emphatically. I mean, there can be no middle ground, certainly in the library when it comes to freedom to read. Um, so I proactively have to have a very strong collection development policy that I can point to when people say, my cat's there, sorry. Um, <laughs> when people um, uh, can point to and say, um, why is this in, in the collection? You know, this is why, um, you know, this is how it fits into what we look for, uh, for materials, because we're there to show the uh, depth and breadth of the human experience and have books for all members of the communities, not just the ones that are visible. Um, but the ALA Office of Intellectual Freedom um, from the American Library Association, hugely helpful. The Rainbow Roundtable, helpful. And, um, you know, of course, the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund um, has plenty of material should you need it. And, and the challenges don't always come from the patrons, my customers. Um, it can come from the administration. It could come from the board of trustees. So it can come from within the institution. So there's all kind of schooling that needs to go on. Mm -hmm. I would say we, we, as much as we can support creators, you know, different diverse voices, that's, that's also where, where we kind of win this battle where there's just, you know, more and more content uh, flooding the, the retail spaces and the libraries that's better for everybody. Um, so um, Prism Comics, for example, does a queer press grant every year um, uh, to provide um, uh, support for independent, you know, self-published self uh, queer comics creators. Um, there's, you know, as um, uh, some, some was, I think Katie was talking about uh, uh, Kickstarter and stuff being, or, uh, being a, a big platform now, um, uh, for production of queer comics content. And that's really exciting. It democratizes uh, production in a lot of ways. So we should be supporting stuff like that. Get on Kickstarter and find some good queer content and, and support it. Um, so I, I, yeah, as much as we can support queer uh, content being made, uh, and diverse content being made in general, that's that's got to help. Paige, Katie, do you have any advice for people facing censorship? I was thinking when you said that, uh, I would probably call you guys. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're here for. Yeah. <laughs> but um, CBLDF also offers a number of resources to help people um, prepare for the potential eventuality of censorship. Um, kind of one of the things we always advise is being prepared is, you know, the, is the best defense, um, anticipating that it might have and having talking points. Um, one of the things we, we have a retailer workshop where we're, we're teaching retailers about their rights um, as far as the First Amendment goes and how they can deal with various things that might come up like a media attack, and that has happened where a retailer or an educator has assigned uh, LGBTQ content and been attacked for it in the media. Um, so definitely, like, if you, if you do need help, CBLDF is a, a very good place to reach out to, and we're very easy to get a hold of, 1-888-88-CBLDF or info at cbldf.org. So, Katie, do you have any advice? Sure. I mean, I think that having a strong community on your side is always helpful when you find yourselves in these larger conversations. So doing the work in your spaces to make sure that people are educated, that, that to the extent that you can, you are building a supportive community. Um, I know that for me, sort of on a philosophical level, especially when I'm dealing with stuff for kids and teens, um, my starting point is that I want to see kids alive and thriving and that when I want to talk about should we have queer content available for kids and teens, um, uh, critics like to point to things like very high suicide rates among uh, trans and queer um, teenagers. Uh, but I feel like we've got really good evidence on our side that the thing that protects those kids is feeling accepted by their communities. And that's where being represented, being represented in the stories and media that surrounds them 
um, is a really key piece. Having those mirrors, having those windows into other kids' lives um, is hugely important. And so I feel like when somebody comes to you with the premise of we have to protect our kids, um, there is such a clear answer of the way that we protect all of our kids is by giving them a world where they can see themselves and feel accepted and feel valid and feel loved. And that's what these books are doing for them. It seems also, I mean, you're creating a space as a you, Valerie, with a library like that, that where fandom also can create a kind of community, a safe community, right? Where uh, people um, not only are kind of reading this material and, uh, as a window into other lives and to a validation for their own, but they're also then interacting with other fans at these events and the library or whatever. So, and that becomes an incredibly, you know, powerful um, uh, community building. That's a great point, Justin, I think. Thank you. So um, we're going to actually open it up for Q&A here in a moment. But before we do, I'd like to give everybody a chance to plug their projects. What are you guys working on and where can we find it? <laughs> Justin, <laughs> Justin, you're in a Kickstarter. Tell a talk about Kickstarter. So we're actually in the final days of a Kickstarter for uh, Theater of Terror, Revenge of the Queers. And it's a, uh, <laughs> it's a big queer horror comics anthology. Uh, with some, uh, it's hosted by Peaches Christ, who's a local drag queen in San Francisco, and she's like uh -huh. a horror hostess. And um, it's been really fun. I'm working with a lot of really great creators: Tana Ford, uh, Cena Grace, Mariko Tamaki, um, Lee Mars, Howard Cruz. Uh, we've got some amazing people in this anthology, and it's been so much <laughs> fun. And then, oh, and Maya Kobabe also. I got this is cool. So Maya was my student, but my writing mentor was this woman, Rachel Pollack, who was one of the first openly trans women in the, in the trans people in the, in the comics industry. Uh, she, she, you know, back in the, uh, she created the first trans superhero, Coagula, back in 1993 in the pages of Doom Patrol. So I got Rachel Pollack to, to write a story about a trans wear cat 1930s Paris um, and uh, Maya to illustrate it. So it was kind of three generations of us queer creators kind of legacy stuff. It was very, that was exciting. Um, so yeah, that's, it's been, that's been taking up my time. And then also uh, working on this film, a documentary film, uh, No Straight Lines, The Rise of Queer Comics. We've been interviewing Alison Bechtel, Howard Cruz, Rupert Kennard, Mary Wings, um, and yeah, creating, getting their stories on, on film. So that should be hopefully hitting the film uh, festival circuit next year. We're doing the final editing and post-production stuff now on that. Great, thank you, Justin. Paige, um, what are you working on? I'm working on a young readers, uh, a graphic novel for young readers. It's a trilogy. It's titled Peanut Butter and Crackers. And it's about, <laughs> it's about two dogs and a cat. The cat's name is Butter, in case you wondered. <laughs> uh, it's, I haven't posted anything on social media yet. I kind of like, uh, I'm always like paranoid until the, like the contract is actually signed. But I'm working with uh, Sheila Keenan, if any of you guys know her. She's a great editor. In New York, and like 40 pages in on the first book, so it's coming along. Can't wait for this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, uh, Katie, Valerie, unless you have anything to add, let's go ahead and turn to the Q and A. All right, so um, okay, first question up: How do we, as readers and fans, help send a clear message to mainstream publishers to continue creating quality queer characters? Well, buy them. Yeah, buy, buy books. yeah go to your, them. tell the library to uh, your tax dollars want queer comics. But then also um, tell the publishers that you're buying them, tell them why you're buying them. And as much as possible, even though there is so much to be angry about, be positive with the publishers when you're telling them that you're buying them and why you're buying them. They would so much rather hear what you're excited about than what you're angry about. And wouldn't we all? Um, there's so much to be angry about, but when you can, just be so psyched about the good stuff. I, I mean, I think comics has this unique history in, in terms of interaction with fans, right? I mean, we, the letters columns and pages from, from comics um, have a long history to them. And certainly that's continued with web comics. So we should be using those formats and those, those, um, those technologies to, to give positive feedback and negative feedback when it's necessary. But I agree with Katie. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to be really excited about. Thank you. So, um, okay. Uh, our next question, uh, do you guys have any recommendations on how to shut down uh, anti-queer uh, sentiment against comics? 
You mean like uh, globally or like on a particular platform or? <laughs> um, well, I, let, well let's, Is the question very, it's not very specific. Uh, it's, it's not particularly specific, but um, I guess, you know, the, the, there's kind of, there's a lot of anti-queer trolling on uh, the internet. It's horrible. It's very annoying. <laughs> yes. So do you have any advice for dealing with that? And there's a lot of approaches. My answer is report and block and report. Yeah. And yeah. block. You have yeah. a limited supply of energy and you are so much better off spending it creating beautiful things and yeah. living your beautiful life than you are letting negative people mess you up. And it will absolutely toxically mess you up. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, so um, we have a question from Charles. He's in elementary school in California. Uh, what materials would you recommend for um, a primary grade, first through third grade students? So, and uh, feel free to suggest something outside of comics because I know there's not a lot of comics um, available yet for that age group. Valerie, do you wanna go? Something like, um Something fun like the Tea Dragons. Um, oh, Tea Dragons uh, Society. Um, so charming, um, perfect for a younger grade cucumber quest. Yep. Um, might be one I would I would definitely recommend for for the younger crowd. Cardboard uh, Kingdom too. Strong. That Cardboard Kingdom Cardboard would be fantastic. Kingdom. And and I I think if you're talking um, not necessarily to the kids but but to the parents. I mean. Queer comics for, for kids had, really have nothing to do with sexual or, or, orientation or sex in general. It has to do with identity, um, as we've been speaking about. Um, so they're not, you know, crazy wild sex scenes with, um, you know, these little dragons that grow tea leaves. No, it's, that's not what it is. Um, uh, they're just beautifully inclusive uh, lovely stories um, and 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 they are there are more and more each each year I remember speaking about uh, queer comics for emerging um, readers back at the first flame con which is a queer comic con um, kind of thing here in New York um, and we didn't have a lot to talk about but now um, there's more and more. Um, I'm actually going to be talking on the subject again at the New York Library Association con uh, conference in November. And now it's hard for me to pick and choose which ones I'm going to include to talk about. Great. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to ask one last question from Royce. Um, let's talk about what comics would you recommend for a store or um, library collection that's heavy on superheroes, but light on queer comics? Uh, some of the memoir comic uh, graphic novels or the, uh, the graphic memoirs uh, are, are, you know, a, a good place to start. You know, Fun Home, uh, Fetch, uh, Calling Dr. Laura. Um, uh, Cena Grace has some great memoir stuff. If you want to mm -hmm. even find people who do uh, superhero comics, um, and then find the stuff that they that they do on the side, that they, or they do um, for themselves. So um, Mariko Tamaki's uh, Skim, uh, Mariko and Jillian Tamaki's. Um, there's a lot of just wonderful content that uh, it tends to be more about kind of slice of life and memoir work. That's a mm -hmm. good place to start. Royce, I might be reading your question sideways. Are you asking for where are the good queer superheroes or are you asking for how do you bridge people who read superheroes into reading queer content? I don't well, know. Um, Tools to answer me. Yeah, uh, we can take the conversation <laughs> offline because uh, we're, we're getting tight on time. So Royce, thank you for your question and we'll be in touch with you. Uh, for further clarification. Um, I want to thank the panelists. And before I pass this off to Holly to wrap us up, I do want to uh, point out to everybody, if you need help, if you need advice, if you've got a challenge, contact CBLDF at info at cbldf.org or 1-888-CBLDF. Uh, and um, also we are working on developing some new resources for you. If you're an educator, we have a survey um, that we're currently running. Uh, if you could respond to that, help us develop some new resources. Much appreciated. Anybody who answers is entered in a contest to win a classroom collection. Holly, you want to take us away? Am I unmuted? <laughs> That's not Holly. No, it's <laughs> not. <laughs> you know, it's, 
There we go. I'm back. Hello. Thank you all for such a beautiful, wonderful, uh, informational webinar. You are all fantastic folks, and it's so great. I'm so, so glad that you were able to join us. Um, and thank you, all of our attendees. Uh, before I let everyone go, um, I'd like to let um, our attendees know that Betsy has compiled a list of LGBTQ plus inclusive books, and I'll be sending that handout out to y'all over by next week sometime, so be looking for that in your emails. Um, and I would like to let you know about our future webinars. We have um, four more webinars in the, in the process. Uh, right now we're coordinating with our panelists, so we don't have specific dates for those. Um, but please check our website for updates. Uh, we're hoping to have announcements out again by next week. Our upcoming webinars in July, we're going to be talking about using comics to teach difficult topics. In August, developing a classroom collection 101, we're going to be addressing uh, the barriers to comics to, to talk about how you can address those barriers to creating a comic book collection for your classroom. Um, in September, we're going to be talking about using comics in the classroom. And in October, we're going to be doing um, a manga edition to Know Your Rights. Um, also, if you have any um, ideas for future webinars or you would like to participate, any of you attendees out there, um, please send me an email. Um, I will post that in the, uh, in the chat bar real quick, too, so that you can get in touch with me. And... There we go. Um, yeah, thank, thank you everyone for, for attending and thank you panelists for, uh, for giving us all this great information. And I hope everyone has a beautiful day. Thank you very Thanks. much. Bye everybody. Bye, everybody.